I have two days to get this homestead set up with off-grid power because there are no power lines here. We're running into some major issues, so the question is, is are we going to finish or are we going to fail? I'm going to take you along for the journey so that way you can see how this turns out and then maybe this will be something you want to do for yourself as well. This off-grid homestead has never had grid power connected to it ever since it was built. The owners have been surviving off of a small solar setup and a gas generator that requires a lot of work to keep the lights on. They've been using portable battery lights and living in the dark. This is a wilderness outdoors training facility in Northern California called Thunderstone Wilderness Ventures. It's also their homestead, but it's time for more self-reliance and full power on the property. It is a 20 acre piece of property of prime forest to learn how to live off of the land, build fires, and survive in the wilderness. They specialize in teaching all sorts of outdoor skills for both adults and kids. This survival school and homestead is owned by Clutch and Jess Lambert. As you go through their property, you'll find that there are tons of bush buildings, including lean-tos, as well as game trails that take you through the property. The steady flow of the river gives them the water that they need, but unfortunately it isn't enough water to sustain a hydroelectric turbine. There's even a learning center or museum full of tools made at the school, including arrows, bows, stone knives, flint napped arrowheads, and much more. But it's time to bring this property into the light. They've been surviving by using this Jackery solar generator that they plug into an old fused electrical box. But the issue is the solar panels don't reach out into the sun while keeping the house plugged in, so they use this gas generator to recharge the solar generator every couple of days. They've even had to use a propane refrigerator to keep their food cold. They have this carport which works as a guest house and work area. Everything from installing a main electrical panel in the carport, digging a 175 foot trench by hand, and pulling wire that was extremely difficult. We're gonna go through this installation step by step. They've chosen the 6000 XP off-grid inverter from EG4. It's a very reliable option and one that I usually recommend. It's even the one that I use to run my own off-grid cabin. We'll be wiring this main electrical panel to the inverter to supply power to both the guest house and the main house. Your main electrical panel needs to be grounded. We drove an 8-foot grounding rod into the ground just outside of the carport. Having a powerful SES hammer drill and a ground rod adapter makes this a lot easier than doing it by hand. Your main electrical panel needs to have your neutral and ground wires bonded. This way, if there's any short circuit in the system, it will find its way back to the grounding rod to keep you safe from getting electrocuted. This is done by installing this green bolt into the electrical panel, which causes the grounding bars and the neutral bars to be joined together. All other sub panels should be unbonded, meaning no green bolts. This is a 6,000 watt inverter, and this is an off-grid project with no permits or paperwork being done. We're just here to help them out. And we wired the main electrical panel using these four wires, a red, black, white, and ground. I let Clutch do a lot of the work because, hey, if someone else is willing to do it, then why should I do it? I'm just kidding. I wanted to make sure that he felt comfortable knowing how their system worked, and he was very interested in being a part of the installation. We decided to make the red wire leg one or phase one, and the black wire leg two or phase two. Normally I recommend buying your battery cables pre-terminated, meaning they already have the battery lugs on them. But we chose the harder option of making our own cables for this project. I showed Clutch and Alex how to put the cables together. It's important to make sure that you don't have any loose wire sticking out from the battery lug so that as much energy as possible moves through the cables properly. While they did that, I got busy working on making the main battery cables to go from the inverter down to the batteries while they finished up the small wires. We're using four 12 volt, 200 amp hour LFP batteries from OKMO. Always make sure to charge your batteries up to full in order to balance them before connecting them together. If they're unbalanced, you'll get big sparks when you try to put them together. Once the batteries were connected together in series, meaning from positive to negative, it was time to install the main battery cables. Start from the inverter side and work your way down to the battery so that way you're not working in a tight space inside of the inverter with live wires. Ideally, we should have put both a T-class fuse and a battery shutoff here. You should absolutely do that. OKMO okay, was nice enough to send these batteries out in order to help out Clutch and Jess. By joining four of them together, you create a 48 volt battery pack that is rated to 200 amp hours. That gives them 10.2 kilowatt hours of battery capacity, which is plenty for their needs here at the homestead and to run everything for the school. You can put up to four battery packs together for over 40 kilowatt hours of capacity. Okemo sent the batteries to me in order to prep them before the job. One of them was severely damaged. It had a nasty thick black goo inside and I have no idea what it is. I can only assume it's a fire retardant of some kind, but this battery for sure had to be replaced. Funny enough, the battery pack inside of the housing was still holding 13.2 volts. I sent the picture to OKMO OK and they covered the battery under their warranty without any issues and got a replacement sent out ASAP. It was the moment of truth to make sure that this could run the inverter. Look at that. 
We kept everything turned off in the inverter while working on the electrical panel to make sure everything was safe. We needed to wire our sub panel to run the house over 100 feet away. It's important to keep the same colors of wires matching the same legs. So on this breaker that will power the sub panel, we kept leg one as red and leg two as black. Electrical panels can be confusing. The terminal with the red wire is leg one and runs the left bus bar and the black wire runs the right bus bar, leg two. These wires come directly from the inverter and really should be encapsulated. Clutch was very nice and chose to dig this trench, about 175 feet of it, completely by himself, by hand, in a ton of rocks. So this was a lot of work, but it saved us a lot of time on this job. They opted for direct berry wire instead of pulling THHN wire through conduit, mostly due to the tricky bends and jagged trench that was due to there being so many rocks in the soil. But once we reached the house, I still chose to run flexible metal conduit under the house so that there was no risk of animals chewing on the wires or getting them damaged. While the FMC is installed, I got to work on removing the old power box. This power box is very simple, but old fashioned for what we're doing. I pulled the fuses and wires out and made way for the new electrical panel. Currently their house only has two circuits, but since the bottom of the house is fully accessible, having this larger electrical panel ensures that they can install as many circuits as they need if they ever need more sub panels or power elsewhere. Pulling this wire was ridiculous. I mean, really ridiculous. We ended up having to pull three different times because the wire kept pulling off of the fish tape. But we eventually got it and got it landed inside of the sub panel. Once again, Clutch jumped in to get this all wired up and ready for circuits. Eventually they'll install more circuits to provide more convenient lighting and power throughout the whole house. But for now, we're just getting these wires that were already hooked up back into this new electrical panel. And finally, it's time for solar panels. This roof will perfectly fit two rows of eight 400 watt solar panels. We had the supplies delivered to us by a local supply warehouse. There was a mix up with the rails we got, but they ended up working great in the end. We did get different mounting brackets than we needed because the ones we got were meant for a shingle roof and we had to adapt it to work with this metal roof. Because we were using shingle roof brackets, we couldn't secure them direct to the roof deck like you normally could, we had to measure out every spot exactly where each mount was going to go and drill a quarter inch size hole. Then we used a bolt and a large washer to fasten it tightly to the metal roof. Due to the shape of the metal roof, we couldn't reliably tie into the rafters. There are many ways to get solar panels on a roof. We went with the bottom guy hands it up to the top guys and moved them one at a time method. It worked great. The key is to get the first panel square and lined up properly so that the following panels will easily butt up to the previous panel and bolt in quickly and easily. And when we reached the spot for the last panel, we found that I made a mistake in my calculations. I was off by a couple of inches of how much rail we needed, and this is why you should just leave more rail on the roof than you think you need and then come back and cut it off at the end. We ended up using more splices and rails to get the length that we needed. Normally you need space around the sides of the panels if firemen need access to the roof in an emergency, but since the panels are over this carport area, we chose to use every inch of the roof. It turned out beautiful. There's even room for more solar panels along the bottom edge of the roof if they ever decide that they need a bit more power. Now they have 6.4 kilowatts of solar panels installed and charging their 10 kilowatt hour battery bank. They plan to eventually add more batteries and this solar array can easily handle producing 30 to 40 kilowatt hours a day very reliably. Even after 5 p.m. they were getting almost 50% output from their solar panels and were charging up the battery bank. It took us two days with myself and Alex along with Clutch and Jess helping us out. This was a fun and challenging project that will be here for decades to help bring them power to their homestead and wilderness survival school. For information on a system like this, email me at info at minutemansolar.com or visit the website minutemansolar.com.